This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, I'm talking to Stormy Peters and Sarah Novotny, both of Microsoft, working on their open source team about Microsoft and open source. It is a great show, and that's coming up next. Floss Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they are working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 607, recorded Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020. Microsoft and open source. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Technology Powers X. Learn how technology and IT departments are reshaping their businesses through an original podcast from Dell Technologies. Search for Technology Powers X anywhere you listen to podcasts and download each episode today. And also by Barracuda. Did you know that 91% of all cyber attacks start with an email? To uncover the threats hiding in your Office 365 account, get a secure and free email threat scan at barracuda.com slash floss. Good morning, good evening, good day, or whatever time it is in your world. Um, I'm Doc Searles. Welcome to Floss Weekly. Um, This is the first week when we don't have a co-host, I think, because I always think this, but it's probably true in this case, it is my fault. Um, uh, We were going to have Jonathan on this morning, but uh, apparently we, meaning I, did not notify him of this. So we Rather than the banter that we would normally have at this time, um, I'll just tell you where I am. I'm in Santa Barbara, California, where I'm operating on Pacific time. And um, and I'm really looking forward to our guests this morning um, uh, who are from Microsoft. Um, it has been uh, a while now. I mean, I've been at this for an awful long time, you know, like since 1994. And in the early years, um, Microsoft is like this great enemy sort of of open source. And um, like from the moment it was named, actually, that was 1998, uh, it was. And uh, Microsoft has more than come all the way around. So I'm so looking forward to talking to our guests about that. Those are Stormy Peters and Sarah Novotny of both of Microsoft. Uh, They have a lot to say. I hope we can get some of it into an hour. But first, I have to let you know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Technology Powers X, an original podcast by Dell Technologies. Each episode of Technology Powers X focuses on a different industry and goes behind the scenes to help you understand how technology and IT departments are reshaping their businesses through AI, cloud, edge, intelligent devices, and more. I got a sneak preview of Technology Powers X. One episode is all about theme parks and how they use sensors, massive amounts of data and software to make rides safer, more efficient and fun. Another episode is about the technology behind F1 racing and how the legendary McLaren racing team uses technology to make decisions about pitting, tire selection and racing strategies, both trackside and at their data center. And one episode talks all about vertical farming and how innovative new tech can change where our food comes from and how this may be the future of sustainably feeding 21st century populations. Technology Powers X is hosted by Danielle Applestone, a hardware engineer and entrepreneur. Here's a clip from the episode of The Beer You Love. Today at New Belgium, the ancient craft of brewing has an indispensable 21st century ingredient, hyperconverged infrastructure. That infrastructure supports almost every aspect of planning, marketing, sales, and distribution. You can listen to that whole episode to learn all about how technology powers beer at the New Belgium Brewing Company. Search for Technology Powers X anywhere you listen to podcasts and download each episode today. That's Technology Powers X downloaded today. My thanks to Technology Powers X for their support. And now I welcome to the show Stormy Peters and Sarah Novotny, 
both of Microsoft and uh, and and what they're doing with uh, with with Microsoft and open source technology, how their approach to both within the company and out in the community is helping move the industry forward for customers and partners. You there, folks? I do not wish we to are. be alone. There you good. are. Hey. Hey, good how morning, are you doing? good afternoon, good evening. Good, yeah, good yeah. morning, afternoon, and evening. So where are either or both of you right now in the world? It's always important to us to know these things, even though this is a world with no distance and no gravity. <laughs> it's all down from here <laughs> in the world so of I'm, gravity. <laughs> I'm right in the middle of the should have left. In, in Colorado. <laughs> You're in the middle of what? I'm sorry? In the middle of the United States in, in Colorado. In Colorado, that is the middle. Every time I fly through Denver, I learn that. And you, Sarah, you're where? I am in Burlingame, California, just south of San Francisco, also on the Pacific time zone. Right. So DEN and SFO. Um, mm -hmm. So, so how did how did you guys get involved with this? I mean, I, I as as I said a, a few moments ago, um, there was this long period where Microsoft was kind of like a sworn enemy of open source and something happened. I know everything pretty much, I think, about how it happened for IBM, but I actually know very little with Microsoft. What went what went down there? So Microsoft is making this change as a considered an intentional change, which is really awesome, but it started with um, a definite drive from engineering to be more engaged with open source and to uh, make use of all of the tools that obviously help us build faster and better. And of course, with more eyes on them in, in open source. So we have been, it's been sort of top, bottom up for starters. And then it became top down as Satya uh, began running the uh, company in total. And so Satya has said, we are all in on open source and that we really, really want to be judged on our actions today and how we are growing and learning as opposed to uh, the his actions of our past. And this in and of itself gives you a really fast change because if you have a group that has been kept from doing a thing they want to do and then a boss comes in and says, you can do that, then the change happens a lot more quickly than you might imagine. And so I know both Stormy and I watched some of this change start uh, and, and continue and then even get bigger before both of us were willing to come or either of us was willing to come and uh, commit to work for Microsoft. So, so it was bottom up for you um, as, but not as employees of Microsoft at first. You came into Microsoft after after the command came from the top down that, hey, we're mm -hmm. all in on this and we want to be known for what we're doing now. Is that right? Yeah, both, yeah, both Stormy and I came in um, in the middle of 2019 and we were working um, to help stabilize and also, you know, increase the speed of and grow how quickly Microsoft was uh, getting involved in open source. So my, my first interactions were my, with Microsoft were actually probably 15, 20 years ago at open source software conferences. And I knew that if Microsoft was on the panel, I wouldn't have to say anything because everybody would attack Microsoft. Um, so now I like to joke that I think Microsoft's first contribution to open source way back then was to actually be the common enemy. Um, so at GNOME, we, you know, we united GNOME and KDE because Windows was the enemy. Um, so Microsoft provided that unifying force back then. Um, but luckily, as Sarah said, uh, Microsoft's come a long ways. Um, we want to meet our customers and, and the community in open source software. Um, Microsoft's mission is to help individuals and organizations achieve more. And I run the open source programs office at Microsoft, and we made our mission to help individuals and organizations achieve more through open source software, um, because that is a key part of many of our business strategies. I'm curious, and I, I, you, neither of you, not having been there at the time, may be able to answer this. But I remember, for example, with um, the, the way the word bottom up at IBM is that they they realized the vast number of engineers within the company was already using open source. And um, and I'm wondering if if there was something like that that happened inside of Microsoft that, so that when you came in, you saw, hey, I've got all these compatriots already working on this here. 
and uh, and we actually have a groundswell inside the company. So I, I can't speak to, to how it, it happened back then, but now definitely um, it's it's led from the developers and the engineering efforts. So our job in the open source programs office is to make it super easy for Microsoft developers to use open source. So they're allowed to download and try out whatever they want. And when they put it in their build environment, it automatically gets detected. And we have 9 million open source software component instances in, in place across Microsoft. So it is definitely a groundswell from the bottom up that realize that these are useful tools that they want to participate in open source, you know, build on the work of others and contribute to it as opposed to reinventing the wheel. So, so, um, so tell me about how, how this, how this dovetails with the community, how, how the, you know, you're, you've got these 9 million uh, components, you're working on some of them, some of them are bound to be for things that are exclusively Microsoft or just only appear with inside the company or serve internal purposes alone. And some of them are going to be ones you want everybody in the world involved with. And it may be, maybe you could isolate one or two of those and talk about how, how the two dovetail together. Yeah, so, so definitely some of those components are things we're using inside Microsoft. Um, some of them go into customer products. Um, some go into services that we offer. Um, so definitely it, it spans the board. Um, Sarah, do you want to speak to a couple of the projects that, that you've been involved with? Sure, I can happily do that. Um, so there are also the distinction between first party and third party projects. So there are first party projects that Microsoft wants to bring out and develop a community around. So for example, Dapper which is the distributed application runtime. And that helps uh, people build cloud native applications and in a microservice, microservices model and uh, goes ahead and um, has been published as open source. And we're building out community governance now and trying to move the, uh, move the project in a direction that the community is very much engaged in and participating in. There also are third-party projects that um, Microsoft participates in and engages with and so on. So, for example, we contribute upstream to the Linux kernel. Important, basic, not necessarily glamorous work, but super, super necessary both for Microsoft and for the industry in order to make sure that Linux is healthy and stable and, and continuing to grow and meet the needs of the people who use it. So those are two examples, but tying to um, community more broadly, both Stormy and I have spent a lot of time deeply invested in open source communities. Um, one of the things that, that I did before coming to Microsoft was participating and in, in leading the Kubernetes community. And that, Kuber, uh, that um, community governance and community leadership continues you know, to this day um, making sure that there's space for every company to participate in these projects and every company to take leadership positions in these projects and also to move move again toward that community model where the industry is participating in a project and the industry is driving the project and you know the company is benefiting. Uh, many companies are benefiting, but we're doing this collaboratory, collaboratively across the industry. So, so what, what does your your day look like and how is that different than what you were doing before? I mean, you just mentioned your involvement with the Kubernetes community. Um, is, is there a lot of outreach? Are, are you encouraging people to submit patches? Are you looking for bugs? I mean, what, what, where, what is, what is a typical day for each of you look like? Hey, Stormy, do you want to go first? Yeah. So, so my job, my team's job is to help Microsoft use open source software safely and effectively. And, and so we, we have an open source software policy that we've worked on with the legal team and with the different business leads and executives across Microsoft. We have it all documented online. We have open source champions to help answer questions about it. Um, then we've created a suite of tools. So as I mentioned earlier, when a developer at Microsoft downloads open source software, puts it in their build environment, we automatically detect it. Um, we figure out what license it's under using an open source tool called Clearly Defined. Um, we decide based on that license and how they're using it, whether it needs a legal review or a business review. Um, we automatically kick that off in the tooling. Um, so all of, we're just making it super easy for Microsoft to use open source software. And then we work also with the business leads because at Microsoft, each business unit is, is pretty independent in their strategy. Um, so like uh, 
Skype might make different decisions than the office team makes. And each of them is incorporating open source software differently in their strategy. And so we help help them um, understand what they can do, like, you know, what's what's possible um, and help provide any consulting that they need along the way. So our job is to make open source software um, part of the way that Microsoft does business. So uh, I also have fun stories about um, joining Microsoft in that I, when I was considering joining Microsoft, I realized that I had lived in Seattle for 19 years and had avoided and even sometimes I will admit disparaged Microsoft as a possible place to work. And so I had a really fun moment going, wow, you know, you really do need to be technology agnostic. You are so well that in Linux and anything above, let's let's take a look and make sure that we can also you know, move past our biases and recognize the work that Microsoft is doing now in open source and try and help amplify that, grow that and get bigger. So there is still some hostility here and there. And we occasionally make missteps within the open source community. And that's a challenge, but we really want to learn. And we are acting and and behaving and I hope changing in a way that makes us trustworthy and uh, good collaborative peers in open source. And call us on the carpet if we aren't. We need to hear that and we need to adjust and learn. Just recognize that we are learning. You know, uh, for Linux Journal, which I edited for a quarter century, um, I wrote a piece, I guess it was like five years ago, seven years ago, something like that, saying that I thought that Microsoft is the best possible partner that that uh, that open source could have, or that Linux could have. That, um, And in part, it was because it was started by a bunch of hackers and it was also started from personal computing and, and fundamentally computing, you know, when, when computing became personal back in 1980, really uh, just barely before Microsoft, really before Bill Gates got inspired by Altair, um, that was the sea change. That was the thing that really changed everything that something that could only be done on mainframes could suddenly be done by everybody. And I thought that Microsoft was there at start at the start of that. And that DNA is something that was, kind of continuous. And so I'm kind of wondering to what extent that sort of brought that DNA out within Microsoft since you guys have gotten there. Microsoft has always had a very good story around developers and working with developers to build whatever is next. And that um, there was a period of time where that focus got lost. But I think we're refocusing now on developers, developer experience, engagement with developers, what developers want from our tools, um, how they integrate with Azure, and how um, we can make Azure a better experience for anyone who is building and deploying code. And that refocusing on developers is, is that heart and soul that you saw in the 80s. Um, of the early Microsoft bringing, uh, bringing out help and, and new possibilities to the rest of the world and democratizing compute early on. So that's a good, that's a good segue to another question, which is um, how has the, um, how has development itself changed? I mean, so the sort of the thing in common between you know, Bill Gates writing basic, I think when he was still a student at Harvard before he dropped out. Um, and actually the early open source developers, even late in it, you know, I'm just here working on the file system. I'm just here working on whatever modules, some other thing, but I'm doing, I'm a solo operator. And, and the kind of, you know, we came along with containers. That's a bunch of different things. They all have to cooperate. They all have to work together. How is, how is development itself changed? And GitHub. Okay. So you guys have GitHub now. You know, and uh, and you've got Nat Friedman in charge of that, one of the creators of GNOME, you know, who I met when I think he was still a teenager, you know, working on that. Um, and Miguel Diaz, I think he works for you guys, too. Um, he does. So, I mean, those are, you know, not only alphas in that, but they were solo operators in their own way at that time. You know, it's like we all work together here. We kind of put a garden together, but now it's much more industrial. But you still need that kind of solo geek power going on. So what does development look like now that's different? So the, the lead on that Gnome story, I went out to visit Zimian. Well, it was Helix Code. code Zimian or Zimian and Helix Code. Zimian, I was in my late Zimian, 20s. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was in my late twenties at the time, and I came back and I told my manager, I'm like, I was the oldest person there. <laughs> um <laughs> 
but but I, I think it's really amazing where development has gone. And I think it's only been possible because of open source software. So it, it used to be that one person um, working alone on a laptop could develop a solution that was you know really meaningful and had a lot of impact. And software has come so far and we've enabled collaboration so much that we not only build on the work of others, but we have to. Um, the solutions that we're building are not the things that one person builds in, in you know, in their basement to, to use the the cliche. Um, these are things that people working together are building. You know, all of the cloud computing solutions, all of the storage, all of these things require people to collaborate. Um, I, I also think there's a disadvantage there getting started because it's much more complicated to get started. You know, you're not just writing hello world on your computer. Um, you have to learn about what everybody else has built and how to integrate with it and how to work together with them. Um, but I think it's taking the world to a, a better and bigger place. So t tell me about um, the if the integration, if integration is what it is, or collaboration, or just common interest between uh, Microsoft or what you guys do and the Linux Foundation, because Microsoft is now one of the biggest, maybe even the contributor of funding to the Linux Foundation and is surely involved in an awful lot of what the Linux Foundation does in its various compartments. So, so, so what does that look like? So I'm actually Microsoft's Linux Foundation board representative. And our work there is in support of Linux and, and then in support of all of the associated uh, named funds that are part of the Linux Foundation beneath that, uh, beneath that umbrella. So we are definitely um, consistently working to bring industry, cross-industry collaboration to problems and challenges in open source. So we recently worked with uh, the Linux Foundation or worked under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation with several other companies um, to create the Open SSF, which is the Open Source Software Security Foundation. And it is uh, focused on looking at open source and making sure that the supply chain is secure for open source, as well as longer term investing in critical infrastructure projects that may have not had as much time attended to them or, and so on. So we're, we're working within that, uh, within that organization to try to make, um, make open source better consistently. And then also bring together industry participants and collaborate on, on work that is, to, to Stormy's point, much bigger than one person. And in many cases, the things we're trying to solve are much bigger than one company. So, for example, Kubernetes, if you're trying to move an industry from uh, VMs to containers, you need the industry to buy in and think a lot of it is their uh, idea. So that's part of why Kubernetes was out in the open the way it was. We're doing a lot of things that look like that um, and helping and participating in order to make open source that much more strong. That brings up some other questions that um, uh, I'll get to after I tell you that this episode of Floss Weekly is also brought to you by Barracuda. Barracuda is the provider of cloud-based enterprise-grade security solutions that protect email, networks, data, and applications. Suddenly you have dozens, hundreds, or maybe thousands of employees working remotely, each one of them getting tons of emails every day, making them vulnerable. 91% of all cyber attacks start with an email. Spear phishing, ransomware, account takeover, conversation hijacking. Multiply that by how many employees, how many emails. One click on the wrong email can cost you money, customers, and your reputation. Barracuda researchers have seen a steady increase in the number of coronavirus-related spear phishing attacks since January, and they have observed a recent spike of 667% in this type of attack since the end of February. Get the protection you need for your company with Barracuda Total Email Protection. It includes all-in-one email security, backup and archiving. AI-based protection from spear phishing, account takeover, and business email compromise, and automated incident response that gives you options to quickly and efficiently address attacks. 
security awareness training to educate your workforce so your employees can be the first line of defense against attacks. Right now, there are attacks impersonating organizations like the World Health Organization. Attackers utilize domain spoofing and promise information relating to the coronavirus in an attempt to trick users into a phishing scam. Ensure the safety and security of your business with Barracuda. To uncover the threats hiding in your inbox, get a secure, free email threat scan of your Office 365 account, risk-free at barracuda.com floss. That's barracuda.com slash floss. Barracuda, your journey secured. So, um, so that you were talking about um, industries there, and, and that's one of the things that um, the Linux Foundation does. The Linux Foundation has taken on, let's take on the movie industry. Let's take on, on um, uh, I know that with uh, the CNCF, the Cloud Network uh, Computing Foundation, I forget what it exactly stands for, but it's it's pretty cool. They have this whole e ecosystem. You can turn open source on and off on it and see who's doing what. Um, it's really quite brilliant. But they're trying to get, in that case, the whole 5G or part of the cloud-based part of the 5G world uh, all aligned. And and it's sort of, I mean, so I'm wondering from your perspective, being one company in a number of industries, how that looks to you, how it feels like we're, we're changing an industry here. We're trying to get everybody working together within an industry. We're not all just trying to kill each other. And in fact, we're going to move a lot faster if we're all working together and they can differentiate on other grounds. So I'm wondering how that looks to, to either or both of you. It, I can give a great example. Um, at the end of 2019 at KubeCon, we made a big announcement from the Kubernetes state or from the KubeCon stage about Kubernetes in that we had added IPv6 support and that ended up touching thousands of files, most of the subsystems available in Kubernetes and so on in order to make that big change. And that was done with a collaboration between Google and Microsoft. Um, Microsoft was spearheaded the the drive and was pushing with with Google to get all of this into Kubernetes in a way that you know both of our customers, all of the customers of Kubernetes, and all of the users of Kubernetes could actually benefit from it. So that's an example where it was such a big change across something that affected so many users and so many different sub pieces of the project that we needed to have multiple large companies with the resources they had to bear making this investment of, in, of time and effort in order to move the industry forward. So um, also from the back channel, um, uh, do, do you see and, and, um, Windows, is, uh, Windows is still a proprietary product. Um, it has a sort of a different role in 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 the world at this point. Do you see that being end of life or just drifting off in another direction? Um, I mean, I know that even a highly proprietary company like Apple is is also involved in open source in some ways. So it could be that that Windows is here forever. But I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Neither of us work in so the Windows can't... division. <laughs> <laughs> so we. We can't speak to Windows. Like I said earlier, every business unit in Microsoft is very independent and gets to decide their own strategy and their own product features. Um, so you'd have to ask somebody from Windows what their plans for Windows are. But from an open source program's office perspective, I can tell you that they're using open source software in Windows. Um, so I, I imagine that Windows has a lot of IP in it, not just Microsoft's intellectual property, but probably partners and stuff. So like open sourcing, it would be difficult. Um, but we are open sourcing things in that space and using open source software and including open source software in its future strategy. Um. So, um, okay. So there, you mentioned, I think Sarah, you mentioned, um, Azure earlier. Um, th there was a time I think that everybody thought, Hey, AWS one, a AWS owns the world. Um, but Azure is at least appear at this point. And I'm wondering, now there's an industry, the whole cloud industry um, and the big cloud industry, not the little cloud industry, which is what's going to happen, I think, with um, with 5G. We might want to talk about that later, too. But I'm wondering, you know, where where do you see that going and in 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 both in Azure plus AWS and in Azure versus AWS? And for that matter, other big players, 
in that world too. IBM's there, smaller operators like Rackspace are in there. And I'm wondering how that that whole back end cloud based ecosystem looks to you now. It looks like three to four major players to me still. And, you know, I don't think that race is completely run, but you, I, I expect, and I'm using my magic crystal ball here, just so let's be clear, this is nothing that is anything other than my own vision of the future. I actually expect, as you just described, that there will be smaller, more uh, custom built clouds in time for specifically specific use cases. And that those smaller clouds may be more uh, customized at some point, um, depending on what a particular use or need is. So an example would be a high-performance compute cloud for high-performance compute work or something that may be tuned more toward um, uh, AI ML work or something that's tuned toward financial industries regulations or government, um, we already see it with government, with different clouds being created um, in Amazon and in uh, Azure both in order to have um, different government clouds. So I think we're, we're going to be seeing that sort of specialization in cloud. We started from the, it has to be everything for everyone of infrastructure as a service, and then we sort of grew toward services um, and a very composable model of cloud. And I think that general cloud is going to continue in the path toward more low code development, as well as having space for um, clear development of brand new product as well. But that you will find uh, that you will also find specialized clouds going forward. Stormy, do you have magic magic ball or magic crystal ball that you want to look into? No, I think your answer feels right. I was trying to I was trying to think of history in another field that had the, the same thing. And I, I think we do see that repeat. Yeah. So so speaking of specialized clouds, um I I think it was, it was less than two years ago, but it was a, a couple of um a cloud native computing foundation events as I, I went to is in San Jose. And I'm thinking it's 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 all about cloud, and it turned out to be mostly about five G. And 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 this idea that uh, you're going to locate cloud um, as close to usage as you possibly can, and at a certain level, what I saw was the um, the phone industry, the mobile phone industry, wanting to get into this sort of micro-sized um, version of the cloud business by you know putting the infrastructure out as close to usage as possible. This one's near a hospital. We're going to, we're going to do microsurgery. Um, this one's near movie production. We're going to have low latency there. I mean, the whole cell is low latency and high speed, but, but actually there's a cloud side to that and lots of little imagining out lots of not imagining out so much. It was just sort of like doing the infrastructural stuff toward what we get framed up as lots of sort of micro clouds close to things. Are you guys involved with either of that? Or do you have any thoughts about that? Because it, it struck me as there's this huge difference between what we've always said about cloud, which is this sort of this vague thing that is going to be the back end. I'm going to store stuff there. I'm going to do a compute there. And everything else is kind of gravy on that versus, no, wait a minute. There can be many little mini industries here that are going to, or big industries that are mature, that are going to use cloud at a very localized level with low latency and high speed and what happens then. And I'm wondering just how that looks or feels to you guys. I do think that the way that people access cloud and access technology in general has changed tremendously over the last decade. Um, if you know, it used to be the people using the cloud would be people with you know high performance computers on their desk um, that sat in front of them all day, and now the people that need the cloud are the doctors making the rounds in the hospital. Or um, I, I always think of. Um, when I worked at Mozilla, we were trying to push Firefox OS, which was a HTML-based um, cell phone, and we were doing these user interface studies, uh, you know, user studies in India because we were targeting developing markets where people would need a very inexpensive phone. And one of the women that we interviewed was a hairdresser, and she said, "Oh, this would be so awesome um, because it could remind me to send a reminder to my clients. So I would take a picture after I cut the hair, and then three weeks later, I would send them a picture and say, you know, do you want it to look like this?" And she's like, I could write an app that would do that. Um, so I know that's really low tech and really basic, but I do think it shows that where we think of computing um, 
is happens and is useful in a different space than it used to be. Um, my, my kids are quite happy running around with their phones and expect their phones to do everything. And so they, they want all that access to all the cloud stuff um, in their hands, not on their desk. That's interesting. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, their, those kids, for example, you know, so I've got a grandson now is mm-hmm. starting to write in Python. I mean, he was completely obsessed with doing nothing oh. but video games. Now he's also writing in Python. And I'm wondering, um, you'll have to share the, that secret with me, how you, how you pivoted him, how you make that pivot video yeah. games to code. Right? It was just reported to me. I have no idea. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, what, but part of it, but where I'm going with this though, and it's an interesting question, especially with kids. Um, what happens when they have the easy tools? You know, I mean, for, I think every generation up until now, there was the assumption, I mean, that you're going to work in a shell and you're going to do something with, you know, basically you got to know VI or Emacs and you're going to, you're going to work in the, in a, in, in the command line. And if you're good at that, then you can do anything. And, but I'm wondering about tools now and how easy it might be for somebody, the hairdresser or whatever, to write the app that they need, knowing that the back end is there. And I, I still think we're five or 10 years maybe away from that because everything's being made a little too easy and substitutable on our phones and so forth. And there's, there are too many easy distractions. But I'm, I'm wanting to see if we, kind of a dream of open source in the beginning has been how do, how do, how do we get tools of creation in everybody's hands so everybody could participate in this thing. And I'm wondering if you've so, got any thoughts toward that. Yeah, so I, I think some of the tools that we're coming out with, with VS Code and with GitHub and TypeScript, make it really easy to get started. To get, I think the biggest hurdle to getting started in software development is that getting your setup set up. Like, you know, if you don't have a mentor standing there that's next to you for a week to get you going, it was really hard to get started. And so it'd be hard for kids to get started coding. Uh, but now you can using GitHub and Microsoft tools, developer tools, you can do it all in the browser. So you don't have to have a super powerful computer of your own. You don't have to spend a couple of days getting your environment set up, um, just a couple of clicks and you're writing code in your browser. Um, so I, I, I know we're not, we're not totally there, like the plug and play and drop and not have to know any coding to, to make software, but we're making it much easier for people to get started and for people to create things. So the, and start- the, this is this, Oh, go ahead, uh, Sarah. You were gonna say I was going to say, and, and Stormy actually mentioned um, VS Code, which, of course, is open source. There is more work also from Microsoft, which some of it is open source, but I'm not specific on, or I don't know specifically which pieces are, but there, we're doing a lot of work in the low-code space, working working to make that democratiz- democratization happen. That's cool. The, 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 and this, this pivots a little bit off of an earlier question from, from the audience, um, which is, and, and this is on, toward your remark, uh, Stormy, that the um, that it's all being done in the browser now, and and browsers ha- are mature enough now, and normal enough now, and substitutable enough now. There are lots of little differences between them. We all have our preference, but speaking personally, I have five of them open right now. Um, they're all different, and they're all doing different things. They all have different cookie piles inside mm-hmm. them, and um, but but the basic experience, the basic architecture is the same. And I'm wondering if toward operating, going down one level of that toward operating systems, um, you know, I predicted starting in the 90s that the, that, the, that the Linux desktop would replace all the other desktops, that everybody would be using KDE or, or GNOME. Um, has not happened. Is there, and, and, and you mentioned earlier your visit to Zimmy, and I, there was a dream there with that too. Do you see that happening in the long run? Or is the browser just the place now, and so it doesn't really matter what the operating system is? Yeah, so I, I was executive director of GNOME for a while, so I was very invested in I helping make it. Linux the desktop <laughs> of the future, yes. And a few years ago, I gave a keynote where I drummed up all the headlines for over like the last 10, 15 years of, you know, when the, you know the desktop of, you know, all, all the years, 2019, 2018, 2017. So we've been saying this for a while. Um I, I no longer think it's it's the relevant question. Like I, I think open source and Linux and Apache and all these are they're part of our infrastructure. They're part of our, our cloud computing and people are gonna access them, like you said, from wherever they're at. Um 
So maybe they'll do it from their phones, maybe they'll do it from their browser, maybe they'll do it from a command line. Um, but I, I think Linux is baked into all the things they're doing, so it, it kind of is their desktop, um, but everyone's going to access it. You know, your fridge is going to access it in one way, and your phone's going to access it in another way, and it, it's it, the user interfaces are going to vary. So I'm wondering, it, in, in respect to your corporate customers, um, uh, and, and you may not even be in a position to hear about this because you are so divisionalized and, and you may not see see this. But I mean, so, a, a few years ago, somebody told me, uh, and I think it's true, that um, Exchange basically has the whole world locked into Microsoft that, and, 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 in a way and uh, an outlook within, with, within corporations. But I imagine now that Microsoft is coming at these companies with open source as a as a mission and a, at least a a value system within whatever offerings it's, it's providing, whether those be proprietary or not, um, how that how that changes the way customers come at Microsoft? Is it because suddenly Microsoft's got this friendliness to all of open source and is also talking it up? But I'm wondering if you know out there when their your sales guys are pitching it and people are buying it, how is that looking different? So when when we open source things, one of the things we look at is or one of the main reasons I, one of the reasons that I see for products open sourcing is because they want to meet customers there. Um, so it really breaks down the barrier between customers and developers. They don't have to go through sales or product support or any of those groups. They they actually get to interact directly with the developer and see the roadmap and influence it and contribute to it. Um, so working with customers is one of the reasons we do open source. Um, I also get a lot of requests from customers who want to learn about how we're doing open source internally. So I spend a lot of time talking to everyone from like banks in South America to large U.S. retailers to automotive companies in Europe um, about how what our open source programs office looks like, what kind of compliance work we do, what kind of tooling we do, um, because all of our customers are also now using open source software within their IT infrastructure and their product infrastructure, and, and they're curious. That's interesting. It's a little bit like... Um you're kind of co-hacking your corporate DNA, both on the inside and the outside. I mean, your your bank in yeah. South America is cha changing internally, right? Is that right? Yep, yeah. exactly. That that's really interesting. That that the you know because because I imagine, especially with a lot of bigger customers, they're probably doing some kind of open source work internally, whether or not it's that they have hackers that are actually you know contributing to the Linux kernel or contributing to some other code base, or they're working on something internally where they're just, well, geez, this stuff's laying around out there. We can use it to improve X, Y, or Z we're doing inside the company. Um, that's a really interesting thing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, it, it's, it seems to me, and maybe you could speak to this, that, that, that open source is becoming much more the norm in general as an approach to things than, than um, than it than it was in the past. Let me let me give you an example of that in in a metaphorical example, which is that home construction, in fact, building construction changed utterly. I think it was in 1836 when a guy named uh, Augustine Taylor invented frame construction. He invented the, they already had nails and they already had two they already had uh, lumber mills, but mills, but they were still building with dovetail joints and it was craftsmen only that did it and they all did it their own way. But they found out that you can make two by fours and two by sixes and shingles and the rest of it in a sawmill and that we can frame everything up and frame construction became the way everything was done. But more importantly, everybody could be a carpenter. Everybody could build their own house. And I'm wondering if we, I mean, I sort of predicted that would happen 20 years ago, but I hadn't seen it happen, but I'm thinking maybe hearing for the first time now that it really is. I think it's really, really happening now. I, I think there's a really interesting anecdote to, to construction. I, I'm going to have to go look that up. Like if you'd yeah, asked me, me a minute too. ago, I would have thought framing yeah. was around forever. Um, <laughs> so well, look hopefully up frame construction, my name and Linux journal, and you'll probably find it. <laughs> and it's probably written 15 cool. years ago. <laughs> and I, I think our kids and our grandkids are going to feel that way about software. Like framing is going to be like open source software. Yeah. So, so yes, 
Yeah, there's that moment where where anybody could do it. And then, frankly, that's why we have the show. I think is that is that we. I mean, we talk about tools, we talk about all this kind of stuff, and but I still sense that there's. I mean, not everybody's a carpenter, right? You know, I mean, I and and that's fine. There's a there's a whole um, class of people who are carpenters, and the world wouldn't run without them. But that's a large number, and it's. And it's something all of us could do. I come. From, I'm the only non-carpenter in five generations, by the way, <laughs> the, the first one. Um, but that's okay. I mean, but I can fix cars, and that's something I learned to do too when I was young. So that's and cars could be fixed then. The cars are not open sourced anymore. I mean, they're all they're basically computers on wheels. We just got a new one, and and it's like, oh my God, I couldn't begin to fix this thing. So maybe in some cases it kind of goes in the other direction. I think it's okay if everybody either can't or doesn't want to write code. Um, but I think it's really important that the whole world know what can be done with code. And and so I really wish in our children's education in school around software that, they're, that they would focus on the possibilities um, and what kind of problems can be solved with it. And I, I think that's inherent in Microsoft's mission to help individuals and organizations achieve more. It's it's showing them what's possible and and how they can get there. And I think open source software is, is part of that. It's it's showing what's possible and what people like you can create and what you could partner with someone and create together and, and maybe you provide, you know, documentation or um you know, the, the graphic design work or um, the outreach work and somebody else contributes code and somebody else contributes testing. Um, but it's it's teamwork and it's about what's possible. So I, I given what you just said, I suggest going back and looking at episode 589, which was with um, a guy named Devin Lafredo, who's a teacher in Long Island, who is as an outfit, a nonprofit called Kid OYO for Own Your Own, which is teaching kids this. He's got kids uh, both in the classroom uh, that are ready to go to college and are teaching at college uh, because they're learning on their own and it's fun. Um, and, I mean, you can really start seeing how possible this is. It's a really interesting angle on the future that makes me very optimistic. Um, we've got about it, 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 eight minutes left and I'm, and I've, I've, I've got a couple of questions and I've, and one is a fairly big one, but I'd like to ask this one first, which is, um, is one that you know is one of the questions actually you provided us as a possible teaser. But you know, what advice would you give to organizations who are building their own open source strategy? I mean, quite aside from whatever Microsoft is selling, or you know, or or what you could do on GitHub. But you know, if a company's thinking about and companies do this, I've ran across this. Like we have to get all open source right now. You know, I guess we finally have to. What advice would you give to them for that? I always start with what do you think you're getting and what do you think you're giving by making something open source? So setting expectations early on, making sure that there is a strategy and intent. Like, are you trying to move the industry? Are you trying to define a standard? Are you trying to, um, you know, excite other people to come participate with you? You know, what are you trying to get out, out of that? Are you trying to break into a particular niche um, field and you just want to meet all the researchers that are doing work on it. That's a viable reason to open source a piece of code. Um, and then also to measure what you what you get in return against what you might be giving up by making it by making a piece of software open source. And this is this is for corporations, obviously. It's what is you know you have to know what you're expecting out of it, and then also what you're willing to put in and maintain with the project. And be able to pivot if it doesn't go as you intend. That is an awesome so answer. I, I yeah, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> it is an awesome answer. Um, <laughs> I, I usually end up working with with companies that don't necessarily aren't considering open sourcing a particular product, but that are looking to include open source software in their strategy. And and so I always start with you need to work across the organization. Like you need to have your developers involved. You need to have your legal department involved. You need to have um, maybe your office, your CTO, your marketing group. So you need to make sure that you have all your different functions um, involved in your open source efforts and then develop a strategy and a strategy policy and 
write that policy down and make it available to all of your employees so that you're empowering them to know what they're allowed to do and what's possible. Um, and then make sure you reward them for the right behaviors, like encourage them to participate and make sure that their annual reviews or however it works at your company, that you're rewarding your employees for the behavior that you want to see in open source software. <laughs> there's a, a, a couple of things here and there's a really good pivot, um, which is, you know, that, the first is that I, I love the answer. You have to think about what you're giving as well as what you're getting. Um, I mean, you're not just buying something, right? I mean, you're actually giving and you have to be involved. But it's also that there's the um, – well, this gets a little too off uh, – it is not off track really. That there, um, There's a great thinker I know who said there are two moralities. One is the morality of exchange and that's what the entire economy is based on. You buy this, you get that and there's an exchange. And – and um, and competition is sort of the same way. This one wins, that one loses. But um, the other morality is the morality of generosity. And it's the morality where you don't put a value on your kids. You give to your kids. There's not a price on that. And as soon as you bring price in, you've compromised it. And and that's always been in open source to some degree. But here's here's the pivot that I have. And, and that is at Linux Journal, for most of its history, when we did surveys of our readers, and there were a lot of them, uh, the gender breakdown was 99 to 100% male. And at the same time, all or nearly all of our executives, the, the publisher, the, the editor-in-chief, the, all of them were women. And, um, and, and so you're both women and you're working in open source. And I'm wondering if you could t talk to talk to us about what the changes are going on there. What are you seeing and whatever anecdotes you could provide as well, I think it'd be really interesting because I think we are seeing a sea change here that's way, way overdue. There's so much talent and sensibility and the rest that's been laying by the wayside for way too long. And, you know, so how's that going and where's it going to go? You want to go first, Darby? But we don't have we don't have vi or we don't have audio for you, Sarmi. So I'll go first. <laughs> we don't have your mic. Um, so I think it's going. I agree that it is a hundred percent way overdue, um, and I think there's a long way to go. I think we have to have good allyship. We have to have people who act intentionally to move, um, to, to bring women in technology to light and to bring, um, the microaggressions, the bad behaviors, the historical bias that we learned from our culture. To be fair, I am not without this bias. I, I found it in myself in a couple of, um, uh, a couple of moments when I was interviewing at varying points and I'm just like, wow, I am actually not being a good, helpful ally to women everywhere in this. And that's not cool. So this is not disparaging anyone. It's saying we all have to pay attention to the fact that our culture has taught across the globe us that the, that women on the whole are not, uh, not the same in some way as uh, men. And I think that that's not true. We all have different characteristics and we are all on a you know normal curve of uh, traits. But there are outliers in every direction for every uh, group. And the middle of the mean curve is probably a lot closer than you would uh, imagine when you overlap men and women or than people might imagine. The important thing is to respect and treat with respect everyone that you're working with and recognize that in, in order to get to equity, to get to a fair place, some of this work will have to be, will have to incur change. And that change will be through people saying, oh, hey, it looks like Stormy just made that point, but we didn't really discuss it. Can we go back to that? And that's an ally saying, you know, we need to listen to all the opinions as opposed to necessarily just moving past one rapidly. Um, we see this with women in tech all the time. We see this with men who are more soft-spoken or men who don't come from a more confrontational culture as well. There's a lot of work we can do to just make technology and open source a more welcoming and uh, learning environment as opposed to where it began as sort of a privileged 
um, setting people aside as better at something space. If we really want to have tech be something that is democratized and global and moving the whole world forward, then we need to make it possible for everyone to participate in that in a meaningful way. I, I want to transcribe I, that. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to top that, but boy, that was great. So I, I do think there's change right now. And I, I wanted to share both something I've I've seen um, in the last few years in my career that I think is really interesting. And I wanted to share something that I see at Microsoft that I think will be useful to the open source community if we can bring that to the culture. Um, the thing that I saw is I was involved with HVOS, Humanitarian Free and Open Source Software. And there were a couple professors at Trinity who wanted to get more um, kids into computer science, more university students into computer science. And so they created a summer program and they, they focused it around humanitarian causes. They were gonna work on Sahana, the disaster um, recovery software. And to their surprise, um, in their summer class, there was a lot of women, like a lot more than they had seen ever in a computer science class. Um, and so they studied it, they they talked to the students, um, and they ended up coming to Grace Hopper, and they ended up creating a foundation, and then they got grants to study this. But women were more attracted to computer science and to this open source software project if it was to help make the world a better place, if there was a humanitarian cause. So they weren't coming to show how awesome they were, how great they were, how much money they were going to make. They, they, they were were more attracted um, when it was described as a way to make the world a better place. And I mean, open source software is perfect for that. So if we could just build on that, um, I think we're onto something there. And I think we have a lot of energy right now around wanting to include more diverse people, more everybody in, in software and in open source software. So I think there's a good timing opportunity now and some good learnings that we can put in place. Um, on the, the Microsoft side, um, when I came to Microsoft, I was really surprised that Microsoft is, is much more diverse internally than um, most of the software industry, I would say. Definitely more diverse than, than open source software. And they have this concept of allyship, and it's a little different than what I think most people think of when they say allyship that I would love to see them bring to open source software. Um, so when they talk about allyship at Microsoft, it's about assuming the best intentions of everyone. So if someone says something, if someone interrupts somebody in the meeting, like um, say I interrupt Sarah and I speak over her, it would be considered being my ally if someone came to me afterwards and said, you know, Stormy, you interrupted someone. I don't think that's what you meant to do. And we didn't get to hear her ideas. And I, know, I know that wasn't your intent. And I know you want to like include everybody. So I just wanted to let you know this was how you did this not quite right and how you could do better. And so they become my ally, not just the ally of the, the underprivileged or the ally of the per, of the minority, but you're also an ally of people trying to make a difference in the world, of people that are the majority that would like to see some change. And I think if we could bring that to open source software, it would be so awesome. Because right now we have a culture where we criticize, we put down, we tell people how wrong they are, and it, I think it really shuts them down. And so I think if we were their allies and pointed out how they could be better, um, perhaps privately, when we coach them, I think we could end up with a better culture overall. So I would love to see that cultural difference. And I'm personally working on it and encouraging all the Microsoft employees that are working in open source software to do that as well. That is also And I'll vote that Stormy yeah. topped my answer. <laughs> well, it, it, there's that. That would be too competitive, and we don't don't want to see that. I I, I have to <laughs> I have to say this. Also from the back channel, two things. These ladies are awesome, and that was said before I asked asked the question. By the way, and the other one is I am a fan of these two. So inspiring and awesome. So thanks so much. Um, we actually have to wrap. Um, I'm going to end with just two quick questions uh, that we ask everybody. One is. What is your favorite text editor and scripting language? <laughs> Do we start fights with this? <laughs> my, my favorite language is the one that I most programmed in, and this will date me because I haven't programmed in a long time, will be Perl. Um, and my favorite editor, which I spent way more time in than Perl, was uh, VI. I was a systems administrator for a long time. <laughs> I'm lucky I didn't have to. So mine, mine would not be Perl. I spent many hours of my life trying to debug a huge Perl script, and it will never be my favorite. Um, 
I, I, I was an Emacs user, so I was also not a VI user. But these days, I feel like I'm just a little bit of everything. Like, I feel like every task I try to do has a different set of tools to use and a different way to collaborate. And I'm all about meeting people where they are. Um, so I feel like I learn a new tool every week. And that's cool with me right now. Well, th that is great. Um, I'm reminded, by the way, hell is other people's pearl, right? <laughs> you know, so anyway... <laughs> Thanks so much, both of you. This has been a fantastic show. And um, and uh, I'm going to shout it from the rooftops that this has been really terrific. So thanks so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. Happy thanks for having us. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, everybody, for being with us on this. And I'm sorry, next time I will have a co-host and we can have banter after that. But in the meantime... Uh, this is a terrific show. I really think it's one of our best. So again, I'm Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. We'll have another great show next week when we'll be talking about standards. Thanks a lot. See you next week. One more twit? Well, you got to check out iOS Today. That's the show where Leo Laporte and I cover everything you need to know about iOS. It's the best apps, the best games, and everything you can do with your iPad, your iPhone, and your Apple Watch, plus car kit and so much more. Twit.tv slash iOS.